so uh, welcome everybody to our first webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have everybody on the phone and to uh, get this started. So we decided that a good topic to start off with would be just the life cycle of a submission, um, because I know it seems like it's a little bit of a black box. You submit a LOINC request, and then you know suddenly months later you have a LOINC term. Um, but we thought we would walk you through the process of how we actually get from point A to point B, and there are actually many, many points in between. Um, so just to give a little overview of uh, you know, how the next hour will proceed, we were going to do uh, quick introductions, um, and then we were going to do just the overview of the format, um, which is basically, you know, basically talking for about 25 to 30 minutes uh, in terms of the life cycle, and then we wanted to have about 25 minutes available for a QA. So, um, you know, we want to leave a lot of time for questions, and if you have, you know, a burning question during the talk, feel free to speak up and uh, ask the question during as well. Um, so, again, obviously this is uh, Swapna, and, and Jamie is having technical difficulties, but she's Back, so she's here as well, and I think um, I think you all know us pretty well, so I don't think we need to do more <laughs> introductions than that. Um, so maybe we will just uh, we'll just jump in. So let's see. So life cycle of the submission, and we're hoping to have these I think about monthly or every six weeks or so. Um, and again, I know on the initial email. Um, everybody was asked to, you know, submit any topics that they might be interested in hearing about on one of these, and so, you know, you are continue to be welcome to do so. Um, all right, so basically to jump in, um, just an overview of the steps for how to um, get from submitting a LOINC code to actually getting a LOINC code. So we're going to go through just the different ways to submit for a LOINC code, the initial intake, the primary processing, the QA review process, and then basically everything that happens after the QA, followed by sending the completed term report back to you, and then the public distributions. So as you know, uh, LOINC grows because you ask, and over the years, it's because of all the terms that you guys have requested that um, that we have grown, and um, or you know both nationally and internationally. And we hope that you continue to request new codes, both in the laboratory and the clinical domains. Um, and so basically, ways to submit to LOINC. So there are two primary ways. So one is through RELMA, which um, you know I think we get probably maybe half and half RELMA and spreadsheet submissions at this point. So you can submit through RELMA either just directly through the web and there's a screenshot uh, you can see in Realma. You can actually choose whether you want to submit through the web or by email if submitting through the web is not an option uh, where you work. And so those files come in, um, no matter which way you submit, web or email, as a JSON file. Um, and that goes directly into our submission system. So we actually don't see what you've submitted until uh, we look at the submission system itself, which I'll show you in a second. Um, the, so the second way to submit is using one of our spreadsheet templates. And so we have four different ones now. Uh, we had three, and then we added one, uh, the last release for radiology. But basically, we have the, you know, the very basic template, the lab template, the form, or you know, survey instrument template and then the new radiology template. And this is just a screenshot of the first uh, tab on one of those splits. It has all of the submitter information. And then um, I think people are pretty familiar with the submission tab, and then we have an example submission in each of the templates um, that's appropriate for that template type. And so I'm going to just show you for a second. Um, where you can find the templates on our new website. So uh, here, if you haven't seen our new website, this is what the home page looks like. And to get to the uh, templates, you just go to content and request new like terms. And then um, if you, you can, there's two options. So there's request changes to existing like content. So 
that you would go through this pathway over here. But today we're talking about new submissions, so you would click over here. And then um, there's a lot of information on what we need uh, from you before you submit. And then we have uh, so the different ways to submit. And then down here at the bottom, we have the four different templates. So here's the basic lab, surveys and forms, and radiology. And to download one, you just click on it. And then uh, here it is on my screen. Um, it's opening up the Excel spreadsheet. And then within the submission template, um, so here's the submitter tab. And then on the submissions uh, tab, we have instructions. So especially for the radiology and the survey um, templates, we have pretty detailed instructions on what each of the columns is supposed to include. So I think those are probably the least familiar to people. Um, and so, you know, so we have a lot of information in there. Um, all right, so going back here. Okay, so then basically, so we get the submission, whether it's in the JSON format or the Excel spreadsheet. And so then we have uh, two slightly different processes. So for the spreadsheets, because we can open them up and look at them right away without actually importing them into our system, um, usually that's the first step. And so we would, you know, look at the spreadsheet, make sure the columns are, you know, filled out as much as possible. Um, look at the supporting materials that were submitted, and then if there's any questions right off the bat, then we go ahead and you know email and ask for additional information. If there seems to, you know if there's package inserts and sample reports, then um, you know we would just send a confirmation that we received all, all your materials and thank you, and you know we'll let you know if we have any more questions later. And then we would load the spreadsheet into the submission system. Now, for um, the ones that come in through Rama, we those go directly into the submission system. So we actually take our first look at those in the submission system itself, um, and I'll show you that in a second. But then, basically, it's the same process. So you know, looking at all the fields within the submission system, making sure you know we have all the information that we need, and then again, sending the confirmation email. Um, when each submission comes in, um, each submission is assigned a unique ID, and each term within that submission is also assigned a unique ID. And you'll see these reflected in the completed report when you get it back. Um, and then we have various statuses uh, for each term, well, at the submission level and the term level, actually. So submissions uh, are assigned a new status when they come in. That's sort of the default. Um, and then I'll walk through the statuses a little bit more in a second, but um, in general, we process them in the order in which they are received. So what I'll do is I'll just show you the statuses for a second, and then I want to show a screenshot of the submission system, or not a screenshot, the actual submission system itself. Um, so these are some of the submission statuses. So again, new is the default status prior to our initial review uh, and before it's you know, approved for processing. Um, the pending status means that, okay, somebody's looked at it, you know, we think it's good to process, and, uh, but it's in queue, nobody's actually actively working on it yet. Um, in process uh, is pretty self-explanatory, and then, you know, we have a few categories of on hold. So there are some terms, especially in survey, but some in lab as well, that actually are copyrighted, and so we have a whole process in place to get copyright approval, and that can take anywhere from a day, that's our fastest ever, I think, recently, that we actually got copyright approval to, you know, months and even in some cases years. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that status tells us a lot about, you know, how long it takes and we can run different metrics on, um, in general, how long the copyright process is taking. Um, then we also have the situation where sometimes the submitter says, oh, you know, actually I submitted this, but we're not quite ready to get the code yet. Can you please put it on hold? So then we would go ahead and do that. Um, and then, you know, we have several others, but just a few others on this slide. So we have the completed terms, meaning all the submission, I mean, all the terms in submission have been processed. And then um, in a few cases, we uh, do reject the submission, um, but those are pretty, you know, few and far between. Um, and then uh, sometimes the submission's withdrawn completely. And so then, you know, we have a status of withdrawn. Um, so let me go, let me see. 
so this is uh, just sort of a zoomed out shot of our submission system, and I've I've sort of hidden the fields that have any uh, <laughs> any information um, about submitters. So um, hopefully it looks okay, is it, and it's big enough that you guys can read it. Um, and so you can see, you know, basically I just have them sorted in terms of uh, newest to oldest. Um, actually, that's not true. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Um, so here, so here are the newest terms. Um, you can see a lot of them are unassigned at this point. These are the ones that have been coming in, you know, very recently. And we have all these different statuses. So these are actually statuses for terms within each submission. So this shows you the number of terms, the number that are pending, um, the ones that are on hold, you know, ones that have questions and process, uh, pre-review, QA, post-review, uh, etc. Um, and so you can see, you know, we have a whole bunch of terms that we are currently working on. And then at the top, actually, you can see that so we have the active submissions, then we have all submissions, which, which include, you know, the ones that are completed as well as the ones that we're working on. And then we have new submissions, and right now there isn't anything in here, um, but this is where the JSON files go. So when you send a submission through Rama, um, it winds up basically in this new submissions area, and then, you know, once it goes through the initial review, then we change it from new to pending, and then it goes over here to the active submissions tab. So once, uh, you know, so basically we assign uh, content developers uh, basically in the order in which the submissions were received for the most part, and we generally, each person's generally working on, you know, at least a couple of submissions at a time, um, because for various submissions, you know, most of the time there's usually at least one question either out to the submitter or, you know, there's a question somewhere, and so um, while that question is being resolved, you know, we can continue working on the other parts of, you know, that submission or other submissions. Um, and so basically, once somebody is assigned and they start working on it, um, the main uh, process is, you know, again, doing a review of all the submitted materials, so package inserts, sample reports, um, forms, etc. <laughs> If there are no submitted materials or there are very few, then we um, will send more, you know, requests to the submitter for follow-up information. We do a lot of research online, so manufacturers' websites. Um, the FDA has a lot of information about various instruments and, you know, the approval information. Um, and then a lot of times we actually also seek input from experts in various fields. Um, you know, that we've been in contact with over the years um, if we have a question. Um, part of this is also to determine if any or all of the concepts are copyrighted, and then, like I said, you know, we begin the copyright approval process. And then at this point, we also check for duplicates or similar terms. And then the actual steps for creating a single term. So we have to create all of the parts um, if they don't already exist. So the component, property, time, system, scale, method. Um, another piece of this is linking synonyms to parts. So a lot of times from the information that you submit or that we find doing, when we're doing our research, we find um, you know, alternative names or diseases that are linked to a particular text um, you know, or other information that's important, um, like an allergy, allergen code or something like that. And so we create synonyms and link them to the parts. Um, this is also when we create the answer lists, we write descriptions for terms or parts as needed. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of additional information as well, such as the class, uh, class type, whether it's an order, an observation, the units, and all of that information. Um, so there's a lot of steps that go into just, you know, creating, or not even creating, just processing a single term. So I just wanted to show you what a submission looks like. Um, in more detail. So this is a submission that uh, I worked on last year um, for the National Eye Institute, and it has, um, I think, a couple of hundred 
uh, terms in there and it's grayed out because these terms are done and so they over here you can see they have a done status so they're grayed out um, but I, I just thought it was a good example to show you know all the different types of information and so you can see you know the six main parts of the length term up here at the top units you know some other information and sort of a zoomed out view of the submission as a whole and you can see there's you know many pages to this submission because each screen only holds you know maybe like 30 or 40 terms and then if you actually go into a term then this is where all the term specific information is so basically all of the information that you submit winds up sort of in this top area so you know here's where the test code uh, the OBX OBR you know if you have send out lab information the vendor test kit the test description that you supply shows up here if there were an analyte description that would show up here, any references that you submit uh, would go in these boxes. Example answers go here. Um, any comments that you might have put in, and then there's the whole history of the term um, as it's created. And then down here, um, this is where we actually make the edits. So I don't know if you guys can see on your screen, but like amblyopia is listed twice so there's the light blue background uh, field and then there's the white field so everything in light blue is what you have submitted and that can't be changed on the screen see I can't I can't uh, do anything to it here but what we do is um, this is where we edit in the boxes right underneath and so in this case you know amblyopia that was the component and so we left it as is but let's say there was a typo in there or something or you know or, or there was a whole sentence about amblyopia, then what we could do is just, you know, change the component to amblyopia. And then this is the information that our system will pick up when it's, you know, when it's creating the name and the term. Um, and then you can see here's the property time, you know, these are the main parts. This is where the names build. And so you can see actually for the long common name and short name, these two fields, how it's in light blue. So this is an automated process. So um, every hour the name generation system runs for the submission system and it creates the names from all the pieces that are there. And so it's kind of a good way to see if, you know, if we're missing any of the parts. And so sometimes what happens is if we haven't created the component part, but everything else is there, all you would see here would be, you know, something, oops, sorry, something like type or, you know, just sort of a fragment of the name without the component part in it. Um, the other thing we can do is we can put in an override. So, you know, in some cases, the automated name um, doesn't make sense or is, you know, is not very useful. And so in those cases, we actually put in an override. And so in this case, I put in amblyopia type as the override. And that's why that's what's showing up here in the light blue. Um, but then here's all the other information. So we have, you know, the class type, the class, the units. In this case, it's not a quantitative term, so there are no units. Um, the answer list, so you can see down here, uh, you know, we have the answer list ID and the answer list name, the type of answer list, and then the status, whether it's an order or observation, and then for documents, whether it's a document or a section. Um, in the secondary field, this is where we put in the term description, and then we can put in other information about, you know, formula, panel type, basket order entry, et cetera, everything that you see on the, on the screen. Uh, for forms and surveys, we fill in uh, the survey question source, text, the copyright information if applicable. Um, test kit information shows up on this page. So either uh, if you submit it, it will show up here, or um, you know if if uh, we find information, then we just fill in these fields ourselves. And then if it turns out that it's a duplicate, we can actually assign you know that code that already exists. Um, to this particular term um, and so I'm not going to do a search similar right now because this one already has a code and I think the system would get a little bit confused but sometimes it actually you know it will find the exact matches and if there is an exact match it also will highlight the first part in red to you know give us a visual clue that oh you know there seems to be a duplicate here so you better go check um, and don't keep working on this term until you figure it out um, and then external communication. So I know we have a lot of communication through email, um, but basically this is where you know we try to keep track of all of the information related to um, our communication with you. And 
I think the comments to submit are actually wind up on the completed report form. So if you see uh, comments in your completed report, um, this is where they're coming from. And then we have this internal communication tab to keep track of you know, our, our notes, uh, both for ourselves, like the person who's working on the term, and notes for the QA reviewer. Um, all right, so then going back to the slides. So then a little bit about the QA review process. So uh, we have several steps. So the first review is uh, sort of an ongoing process and it's the initial review by the lead content developer, um, which is usually me. So uh, basically when the other content developers are done, uh, you know, working on the submission, then they create the QA report and they post it for my review and it's usually submission by submission or if it's a big submission then you know maybe a part of the submission or grouping it grouping the terms together somehow and then um, after that's done you know I, I give my feedback and then uh, they make updates to the terms revise the descriptions um, etc and then the second review is our monthly monthly sorry uh, QA review process where we have internal and external link experts and for that we actually create, the, it's the same QA report, except it includes, um, you know, all of the terms that are going out for review in that cycle. So, you know, from different submitters across all different classes and uh, both lab and some clinical as well. Um, and so usually the first review, it's, you know, it's sort of shorter cycles. And then the second review uh, usually takes several weeks to get the um, QA report back with the comments. So then um, after the QA process is finished, um, you know, there's more steps. So basically editing terms or parts uh, as needed, depending on the reviewer suggestions, um, editing the descriptions. Um, a lot of times, you know, the QA review brings up more uh, questions for the submitter. And so, you know, you might get emails saying, oh, well, you know, during QA, the question came up about, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and then uh, sometimes there's another step about following up with the actual QA reviewer after checking with the submitter. And then sometimes we have subsequent QAs. Um, if a term is determined to be a duplicate, we map to uh, the existing term. And then finally, we push the magic button and <laughs> we make the link code. And oh, I'll actually show you that on the other screen. So here it's grayed out right now because this link is already made, but basically this is where we have all the different term statuses where you, you see done. And so we have a status for add and once this is set to add, then the make link becomes active and then click on it and then the link is generated and uh, that goes up here, it ends up showing right here. And I think a lot of times people think that, you know, when they request a term, really like all that's necessary is the make link, you know, like clicking bu that button, but um, there's a lot that goes on uh, before that. Okay, oh right, and then there's more fun. So uh, <laughs> after we actually make the codes, um, then that's when uh, we do things like build the actual panels. So I was, I'm gonna show you, this, you know, a little bit of our tree tool in a second, but that's a, you know, program that, um, that uh, John Hook built here. Um, and so that's how we put our panels together and put in all the extra information about the panel. That's also how we, uh, or that's also when we assign the attributes, um, such as the panel type, uh, veterinary or public health, those flags. Um, then we also, you know, link to related codes, um, like from uh, Radlex or uh, SOMED or, you know, various places. And then we send you the completed report. So, um, so I don't know if this is visible, but I've sort of zoomed in on this lupus anticoagulant panel. So this is the tree tool. You can see here, tree tool, form. Um, all of the panels that we have are basically in here. So if I were to, you know, scroll up or down, you would see, or, you know, what are thousands of uh, panels. But Basically, you can see here's the top term here. So this is the lupus anticoagulant two screening tests with reflex panel and the code and the short name. It has sort of select information. And then these are all the codes underneath and you can see they're indented over here um, so that, you know, there's children. And there's actually several levels. So, you know, let's say we actually had another panel term in here and had several children underneath. You can actually, you know, nest 
uh, several panels in here, and you can see these one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. Um, so you can see what level you're at. But uh, the one thing that's you know good to see is uh, I just wanted to show you this is where we put in the information about you know the um, cardinality and the conditions for in inclusion and actually this scrolls over quite a bit um, and we don't use a lot of this information but you know the, the skip logic and you know calculations and all that stuff is in the tree tool and so if you go into a term you know it shows you all the different fields. And so this is where we type in, okay, this test, you know, it's a reflex with alternatives, and then here's the reasoning for why. And if you look at this term in Realma, um, and, and, you know, within the panel, then you'll see all this information, um, including the condition for inclusion. So this is where we put that in. Um, so then just a little bit about the completed term report, which probably you all have seen. Um, so it contains all of the terms in the submission that have been fully processed. And just to keep in mind, when we say fully processed, that doesn't necessarily mean you know every single term has a new blank code. Um, there might be some duplicates. There might be some terms that you know we determined that um, we shouldn't make or that were withdrawn um, or didn't have enough information. So there's you know there are a lot of different term types. Um, in that completed report. Um, and it includes all of the information that you submitted as well as, uh, you know, the primary information about each link term. And then this just shows some of the statuses that show up on the completed report. So we have the done, you know, those are the ones that um, have a new link code, duplicates. Um, in the case of duplicates, then um, the link that it was mapped to shows up um, in the term report as well. Um, IDUP is uh, our way of indicating that it's a term, it's also a duplicate, but is actually previously submitted by the same submitter or organization, or is actually in the same submission. Um, so it's, it stands for internal duplicate. NSI is not sufficient information. Um, and so sometimes we have the situation where, uh, you know, we have questions, we've been reaching out to the submitter. Sometimes we just we don't hear back um, after several attempts, and so we have changed the status to NSI and then, you know, send back the completed report, or sometimes it's just even after, you know, many attempts to clarify, it's unclear, and then, you know, we decide with the submitter that, okay, maybe we shouldn't actually make the term right now because there's not enough information out there, and so that's another situation where we would assign uh, that status. And then, of course, you know, withdrawn, and then X, uh, which means that um, we don't think it's suitable for link code at this moment in time. And again, we don't use that status very much. And then um, in terms of the distribution, so we have the pre-release page. Um, so that's just link.org slash pre-release. And we update that about every month or so between the official public releases. And it basically is, you know, a record of all of the link codes under development for the next release. And um, we actually updated it a little bit so it has more information on the new website. And so I can show you that real quick. Um, so you can see um, it was updated uh, last week. And we have 354 new codes that have been processed since the last release. And then um, you can see, you know, here's all the codes. And then... You can actually see there's more columns. Hang on, let me get to the bottom of the page here. Oh, I guess there wasn't that much more information. Um, but anyway, I think there's more information on here now than we had uh, on the pre-release page with our old website. So anyway, and then you can sort. So let's say you want to sort by the name or the code or, you know, the date that it was created or whatever, you can do that. Um, all right, and then the official release, as you know, uh, we release usually twice a year, so June and December. And at that point, then all the links are available on uh, search.link.org as well as through Rama or spreadsheet download. Um, those are the main, the main uh, formats. Um, and I think, yep, I think that's it. Um, we actually have a
couple questions. Pam Banning asked about um, in this within the submission tool, uh -huh. um, the count that we see as far as the active submissions, are those all about just individual concepts or are those the number of submissions? Oh, okay. So hang on one second. Let me go back to that screenshot. So that's a great and question. Pam, I can un oh, it looks like everybody is unmuted. And so um, Pam, if you want to clarify or if you have additional questions about this, let us know. So each of these rows is one submission, and so um, here, like you can see the submission IDs, and then these numbers, so here, sorry, let me expand this. And I think bit. she was asking about the 96 up there, for instance. Um, oh, so, okay, so there's 96 active submissions, so individual submissions, <laughs> and then these numbers and the number of terms show the number of terms within each of those 96 submissions. Okay. And so the all submissions, the 1,159, those are all the submissions, including the active ones, since the submission system went live, um, I'm not sure. Around 2011. Oh. <coughs> so about six years ago. So those are the number of submissions that we've processed since then. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So there are, are there any additional questions? This is Pam. I had one regarding um, when you import from Realma, there are some uh, in some kind of like tieback type of uh, fields, uh, like a reference ID, the send out test name, the send out lab. There are things that you ask us to push forward that don't come back in the report, and sometimes this <laughs> this ends up. Uh, stalling us for a bit to identify with the new link terms we just got, where do we put them? So I wondered, is that an automatic population for to make the completed report? Or sometimes the reference ID is filled back in with a completed report, sometimes it's not. Yeah, so it all depends on where it is in the submission. And we actually updated our completed report maybe a year ago and we added more fields and you know, if there are fields that aren't showing up um, that you would like to have back, we can certainly add, you know, add those fields to the report. But I think a lot of times people put information in different places, you know, for like from the same organization in one submission, they might have something here in the reference ID field, but then in another submission, they might have something in, you know, let's say the test code, like the same information. And so, you know, that's all auto-filled when we create the report. So wherever it was in the original, that's where it's going to wind up in the, um, in the completed report. Right. And if you notice that anything's missing that you would have thought would be there, for instance, a reference ID that you entered in Realma um, and submitted with your submission is not there when we send back the completed report, then let us know um, so that we can look into it. Yeah, and you know, and if there's sort of one-off cases, then we can also just you know do a query and add the information back in because it's all there in the database. Even if it's not showing on this screen or in the completed report, we can always find that information and pull it back in, um, you know, with the appropriate rows. So just let us know. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? We have plenty of time. Well, I'll keep going if nobody else. Has any questions. <laughs> sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Um, when it comes to order panels, um, this, this is a relatively new endeavor for me, and so uh, Mary Sabrisky had sent mine back so I could work on it and make it better and prettier uh, and more in depth. So I'm I'm working on that. Um, but I just wondered how how does the thinking or the processing go? Maybe it's more the thinking. If I'm giving you information about one site and how they run their panels, how is Regenstrief going to consider that panel and trying to make a standardized panel? Yes, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's really tricky. And so I actually reviewed that submission with Mary. The main issue, I think, was that, you know, the panel terms are tre treated the same way as we treat the individual concepts. And so you would see the information like in component, it would say, you know, um, whatever, let's say it was an amblyopia panel, then it would say panel here, and then, you know, you would have all the panel information. So that was the, sort of the main thing with that submission. In terms of, 
you know, how we reconcile with other organizations. I think that's really tricky. So I think, you know, we try to look at different websites to see, um, you know, are other people using this same panel or is this recommended by, you know, some, you know, National Eye Institute or some other, you know, some other organization is a sort of a standard panel. And if it is, then we tend to go ahead and make it. And sometimes what we do is if it's sort of a generic panel, like, oh, you know, here are all the terms for, um, you know, um, let's say vision screening, um, then we make the panel, we don't actually assign like a required and optional and it's, you know, and it's fairly generic and then in the future we can actually add to it. But if it's very specific with, you know, lots of information about required and optional, then usually we tend not to make those unless they are, you know, used by more than one institution and hopefully, you know, even more than two or three institutions. You know, we want to make it useful to everybody, and then, you know, if we have 10 different panels for 10 different places, then nobody's going to know which one to use. Um, so I think that was sort of the long answer. I don't know if that answered your question, though. It does. It does. Um, I know in one of the ones I recently did, I did have to look up at a, another reference lab to see. It was an estrogen fractionation. Uh -huh. And I put over in the comments section, you know, this other lab also adds like estrone, and, and I added a link code just in case you wanted some heads up. Like, I thought that the panel from my client might be a little on the short side, and it could be laid out to other things. Um, I don't know if the tree could help you find other components, like particularly in a fractionation type thing. Um, I don't think so because the tree we basically we sort of build by hand, and so it's not really like it's not something that we can search to find related things. Like we actually use Realma a lot to find you know related terms, um, and you know it's like sometimes we look for duplicates or we look for things that we think maybe should go into the panel as well. Um, but I think we really appreciate when you do provide the extra information and like. I remember a few months ago, um, you know, we made updates to, I think it was like the kidney stone panel uh, where we added new terms. And sometimes we just don't realize we make new terms, you know, but we don't know that they should go in a particular panel that already exists. And so it's really helpful to get that feedback. Um, but again, you know, like the lupus panel was an example of, okay, this is, you know, the algorithm recommended by, you know, these two societies. So then we make it exactly the way they recommend with the components that they, uh, recommend be included, but then, you know, for something like a kidney stone analysis, it's much broader, and so, you know, we tend to be more inclusive, um, and again, you know, as new terms are created, um, we add them, so you'll often see where a panel term itself, like the panel code is old, um, and it contains newer terms, or it's a new panel code and contains really old terms just because we had never grouped them together before. Um, you know, as one said. How much of the 2014 uh, ALOINC order code guidelines that were created are still adhered to? That's a great question. Because um, if, if you want to tell me to let go of that document, I will. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I actually, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, are you asking how much users are adhering to that or how much Regan Street is adhering to that. Well, I've been using it to guide the start of my submissions for panels. Um, but I noticed, I think the release right after, like the June release right after that committee finished, there were things in the release that was showed that Regan Street might not have fully bought into it. So I guess I'm asking how much you guys use it adhere to it. But. I guess I'm curious of an example. Um, I do think that we adhere to it in the sense of like when it is a required or a um, not a required panel but a regulated or panel and there are required optional conditional values in there. Um, those definitely apply. We do have panels where there isn't that optionality in there. Um, and so the idea is that this is an order, and really it's the lab that defines what has resulted back. 
And I'm wondering if maybe those are the panels you're thinking of. Hi, Pam. This is Dan. Can you? Hear me? Uh -huh. Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the the message is, you know, we are adhering to it. We published it in the Link Users Guide, which is sort of our guidelines for how we create things. But there were two, at least two things, sort of in play. One is. Um, you know, there was past stuff that we we didn't have all that info for, um, meaning at the time the panel was created, we didn't set some of those attributes, and we we don't know exactly what they are. And there also might have been things that were sort of already in process uh, somewhere between you know when we sort of voted as a committee and got the documentation ready, and when it was sort of working its way through the pipeline and the QA. Um, but I think kind of from this point forward, I would say I'd encourage you to sort of use that as a as a guideline or a you know a, a starting point for framing your submission because okay. it is the guidance we're, we're telling people um, to use on the mapping side right so as they're you know evaluating can I use this panel can I not use this panel uh, that's kind of the decision about okay when should I create you know a, a submission um, but I would say we're keeping an open mind to learning as we go, and you know, after sort of, you sort of, you make the, the the sort of statements, and then we'll sort of see: are we like, are are the rules strict enough? Are they too strict? You know, are we going to explode out? You know, we we don't know that exactly until we start to see requests, um, and so we'll sort of probably learn as we go and bring that back to the committee for additional um, consideration if we're sort of feeling like something's not quite working right. Hey Dan, this is Cindy. Um, did I uh, do I remember correctly that you guys were kind of getting away from um, in those panels, away from designating certain tests that are required versus conditional versus optional, and just listing the tests that would be most likely to be in that panel? Um. So one of the refinements that uh, I believe it was the last December meeting, and Swabner Jamie can correct me, that we does we we discussed about some specific cases where um, where we were not going to set those, and basically part of that discussion was um, context in which people would expect the panel to grow over time, <laughs> and. Uh, and and so in order to avoid confusion about when that uh, when you know when that happens, uh, not setting some of those attributes it would be sort of important because then your sort of definition of something kind of changes over time. So you're right about that. What I don't recall without looking back at the notes was um, how or if we were going to distinguish those kinds of panels. Uh, in a different way, other than that, they were not uh, going to have the elements labeled as required, optional, conditional, which is actually already true for many of the, as I mentioned earlier, is already true for many of the older ones that we we created. So, uh, yeah. Sondra, do you want to add more there? Yeah. So I don't think we were going to specify those panels, um, you know, in any different way. Um, but this sort of goes back to Pam's earlier question as well. I think. I think we're only going to specify those required optional conditional, you know, all of those attributes in specific cases where there are, you know, very specific guidelines like you should do this test first and if it's this then you should do this other one or, you know, for survey instruments uh, where it's very clear like these are required and these are, you know, you can skip these and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of, well, what if, you know, hospital A is using this panel with these three and then this other hospital is using, you know, four terms and three of them overlap, um, then, you know, I think we do want to be more flexible. And so I think, um, Cindy, you know, so I think we do tend to err on the side of not putting in uh, the required optional conditional information. And, you know, and we also get requests for, panels, like old panels where we do have that information, like recently we were looking at a year analysis panel where it wasn't clear to us even why, you know, why certain flags were set the way they were, and so, um, you know, we're considering revising those, and it could be that maybe 20 years ago, it, you know, it, that's how the algorithm 
like that's how it was recommended or that's how it was commonly done and now that's not the case. So, you know, we definitely reviewed those on a case by case basis as well. But I think you're right. I mean, it's really hard to sort of say like, okay, in the context of this panel, you must include, you know, this and this and then not include these other ones or, you know, these are optional or whatever. So I think it's really, you know, I mean, I, I think more general probably is better in the long run, um, except in specific cases. Yeah, and I and I understand that, and I I just wondered, I just want to make sure in my own mind, you know, that more of the of the panels that are created that are new would probably not have um, the required optional conditional uh, flags set um, at this point. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or, um, you know, requests for future topics that we could cover? Let's swap now. How often are you um, envisioning that you might hold these these loinkinars? Uh, loink yeah, loinkinars. Um, I think we're thinking about every six weeks or so. Okay. Well, actually, this is. This was very helpful. It was a, this really it was a, a good topic to start out on. Oh, good. I'm glad. Uh, but you know, um, some something uh, which I know people struggle with, and I even I continue to struggle with it is, you know, maybe talking about if you're if you want to stay on the, the subject of submissions, talking about some of the fields that. Uh, cause um, some difficulty or misunderstanding or whatever because I know that even though you have descriptions there it's still difficult to figure out what to put into the analyte description versus the the um, overall test description right yeah like these two fields right here yeah so yeah. you know maybe in you know for future topics some of those things um, could be covered just to try to help clarify. Uh, so when you do get the submissions that you might not have to spend as much time on them or get, you know, ask for more information from the submitter and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. And that actually reminds me, um, Pam, I know that we had gone back and forth on a question that you had, and then uh, we had talked about clarifying um, on one of these uh, webinars, just in terms of synonyms and or related names and the fact that they're not actually meant to be exact synonyms. And so um, maybe this would be a good time to, you know, just make that point is that, you know, a lot of times when you look for a certain term in Realma, you know, you get your search set and then you look at the related terms and it has certain things listed. And in some cases those are, you know, synonyms, but in some cases, oops, sorry, um, those actually are not synonyms. They're related diseases, there are other related codes, there we actually have uh, sort of internal statuses for supernyms and subnyms. So there's, you know, more specific terms that are associated with that, uh, with that concept, or more general, like a parent term. Um, and so I definitely would not take what's in related names to mean that this is an exact synonym of the term, uh, you know, that's in the component or the concept that's in the component. Yeah, to say one more thing about that, I would just say the, um, the driving use case is to aid searching. Um, so if it's helpful to find, you know, to get those terms to come back when searching in Realm of, you know, we'll tend to put it in, which means that it's a, it's a broader basket than sort of exact synonyms. Yeah, but you know, that's, that's one thing, um, Dan, that I noticed though, several releases back that um, there used to be a, a field in Realm where you could add some of those names if you knew them. So, you know, you knew that um, this particular analyte is also called something else. Um, but that's not there anymore. I don't, oh, I don't know on, if it would be used. On the, on the submission side? On that, is that what you're talking about? Right. We will look into that, Cindy. Thanks. I don't think uh, any and, of us were aware of that change. Yeah, and I, and I'm 
I hope I'm not wrong on that, but I know I was, and this was several years ago. I mean, it's been gone for maybe two, three years, but that it, it did help. I, I think if somebody who's submitting that request, I mean, even internally, you know that it, it goes by a couple of different names. And I used to stick it someplace. I can't remember where. I'd have to go back and look. But, um, you know, that that might be helpful. But I find that to be helpful many times because, you know, our lab will call something by a name and I'm not finding it in, in Roma um, and, or in the LOINC database. But then, you know, trying to come up with, um, you know, other ways of, of describing it, it really is helpful to have those related names because you just don't, you know, I don't know that any of us know everything about everything. That's <laughs> in the lab. Yeah, great suggestion. Thanks. We can either, we got a lot of fields, so whether we add it or we say, we give you a prompt somewhere to say, and please tell us, you know, here. Uh, in this other field that we already have, we'll find a place to put that cue in for sure. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go back and look and make sure I'm not mis uh, misremembering something because that certainly happens to me fairly often. But, um, um, you know, that just those, I find those related terms, maybe it's just me, but I find them to be very helpful. And I think we do, too, when we're doing research, um, you know, when the terms come in and we're looking to see if we have similar terms um, yeah. or, you know, the same term. I think we actually use that field quite a bit as well. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that, uh, that's another thing uh, to focus on and see how we can, can help to gather some of that information so you guys don't have to try to do as much research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. All right, any last questions? Um, this is Pam. I just had one other thought. An organizationally, uh, organization of the data wise, and part of my issue may be for my situation with, uh, with 3M, where they don't, allow, um, they don't allow us to use the web submission. We have to do it through email. So our mm -hmm. uh, submission gets bundled up into Realma and, uh, and goes out as a as an ac I believe as an access database with tables. Um, and then as, a, as I get a laptop lease turn in every three years, I lose my queue. I, I can't see what I did historically anymore. So I wonder, uh, are other people experiencing that? Or do you find most people are doing it web submissions? And there's an archive where we can see historically what all's been done? go back and check on statuses ourselves, or is that something of the future that you're planning to do? That's a great question. Um, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I know John Hook was listening. I don't know if he knows if there's a way to sort of go back and find that information, but I, I mean, I imagine no, because I totally understand, like, you have to, you're turning in your laptop and getting a new one, so suddenly that information is gone. I wonder if there's a particular file or something that you could copy over. Um, yeah, or you know, could do you copy your LMOF Fox? I believe it's uh, I believe all that is stored in that LMOF. That's that's what I've had to do. This is to just take that LMOF file and just make sure that that's copied from your old laptop to the new laptop. But but Pam, are you talking about like if you're trying to keep track of each one of your submissions, do you do you keep those so you can refer back to them if you need to? Yeah, sometimes I, I'm trying to find which client this submission was for, which interface code did they give us. I'm trying to find the uh, some sort of a missing link back, and um, depending on where it falls in my laptop lease. And I thought that they copied, I thought that they mirrored my C drive, so I just wonder why a new, you know, if I have to do a new install of Realma, why it wouldn't see the old file. I so wonder if it's in a different directory. Then. So I, I thought they copied everything the way it was laid out on public and, and the uh, login specific stuff. Anyway, I won't take up your time with that. I'll, I'll go investigate that and see. Okay, that sounds good. And then maybe in June, also, when you bring your laptop, we can look. 
see if there's yeah, any old file John, hiding you can hear me. Yes, uh-huh. Hi, John. Yeah, uh, Dan's exactly right. If you copy your LMOF file over, uh, all the submission information should be in there, and that, that should be stored in your public uh, documents Realma directory. So if they're just mirroring your personal stuff, it might not be copied over automatically. Okay. Thank you. This was a wonderful event. Um, oh, great. Thank you so much for tuning in. Very, very, very helpful. I appreciate you guys starting this. Great. Thank you. Well, definitely keep us posted about, you know, new topics you would like to hear about, and then we will uh, send out an email about when the next one will be.